Uh, thank you very much. And on the other panel, that was amazing. I'd love to hear um, Emily, more thoughts on Emily and how she's bringing this to um, the community because it's very relevant to my research. But again, I want to echo Liz's comments um, to Philippe and the organizers. This has been an amazing conference. I'm drinking the tea and it's lovely to try to be somewhat connected um, in this online um, world. But I'm a little over 15 minutes, so bear, bear with me. Um, so I'm just, I'm gonna start. Um, so when I proposed this topic to Philippe, I thought it was, a, I thought, great, a topic I know well. I can talk about technology and tech issues because who doesn't love a good um, tech glitch anecdote? And I was hoping to have completed a recent VR program that I could showcase. However, this was in the before times. And shortly after I submitted my proposal, my VR program and the festival it was going to be in was canceled. Um, so I've kept my questions about my program because I would still love to do it when we can all gather together and it is safe. And my questions on accessibility and disability are still relevant. But I've updated my talk a little bit to include some of my dissertation research, which focuses on how film festivals are incorporating XR into their programming. So for my research, I'm focusing on three new media programs, which include games and XR media at Toronto Film Festival specifically. I'm looking at the PopX exhibit at TIFF, the DocX program at Hot Docs, and the Arcade in digital space um, at Imaginative Film and Media Arts Festival. So how are they incorporating new media? What are the logistics, the programming strategies, and who is really driving the inclusion of these works? But one of the questions I asked all of my interviewees is, how are you thinking about access and disability when programming your new media? And I get a range of answers from we don't, to silence, to we're really worried about COVID, to really thoughtful answers thinking about the important role of facilitators and how to create privacy and safety within the exhibition safe, uh, space. But as you can see by the range of answers, there's not a clear understanding of these terms. At many talks on VR, I hear accessibility talked about in terms of affordability and a lot of discussion around how expensive these headsets are and they're not, accept, they're not accessible to the general public yet. And it can be difficult to keep up with the technology when it's changing every few years. Well, yes, I wanna talk about how inaccessible this technology still is in terms of cost. I wanna bring these two words, accessibility and disability to the forefront. These are complex topics with big questions and concerns and daily things able-bodied people such as myself take for granted. Today, I wanna to talk about accessibility and disability in terms of VR, because as much as I love this medium, we have a lot of things we need to discuss. I wanna share with you what I've been reading, some conversations I've been having, and the questions I'm still asking as I continue to plan my VR program. So to start, I wanna state my positionality. I'm a white, cisgendered, and able-bodied woman. I'm not on disability, nor am I a disability studies scholar. I'm not from this community, and so it's important for me not only to credit the books and scholars I am citing, but also the people who have been generous enough to share their ideas with me. So what I want to do with this presentation is to confront my own ableism as an educator and curator of VR, and I want to share some of my mistakes and some lessons learned. So disability scholar Tanya Tukowski says, quote, today disability is very well known as something gone wrong and is often represented as embodied wrongness. And, to better, and for us to better, um, to better prepare for this conversation, we must first define these terms as pointed out by my range of answers to my questions. How are we defining accessibility and disability? Alison Kafer writes, quote, the meaning of disability, like the meaning of illness, is presumed to be self-evident. We all know it when we see it, but the meaning of illness and disability are not nearly so fixed or monolithic. Multiple understandings of disability exist. Disability continues to be seen primarily as a personal problem afflicting individual people, a problem best solved through strength of character and resolve, end quote. And this is the way most able body see and think about disability. And it differs drastically from this, this definition given by Tangled Art and Disability, a Toronto charity organization dedicated to enhancing opportunities for artists with disabilities, which include producing nine annual festivals, employing hundreds of artists, creating partnerships, hosting workshops and seminars, all at free or low cost. So Tangled Art and Disability describes the social model disability, which locates the cause of disablement in the way that society is environmentally, socially, and attitudinally structured. It identifies disabled people as a societal group who face barriers to participation in society that are similar to the barriers that members of other equity seeking groups such as black people, LGBTQ people and indigenous people face. Furthermore, by adopting the identity first language used by these groups, it aligns its terminology with theirs. 
It differs from the medical model approach, which uses person first language and identifies disability as being caused by an individual's medical impairments, requiring individual solutions in place of systemic changes. But as Kafer definition points out, disability is not monolithic. For cultural worker and disability scholar Maya Migas writes, quote, ableism plays out very differently for wheelchair users, deaf people, or people who have mental, psychiatric, or cognitive disabilities. None of these are mutually exclusive and are all complicated by race, class, gender, immigration, sexuality, welfare status, incarceration, age, and geographic location. This leads to my next term, access. Access then is tied to the social organization of participation, even to belonging. Access not only leads to be sought out and fought for, legally secured and physically measured and politically protected, it also needs to be understood as a complex form of reception that organizes sociopolitical relations between people and social space. And this concept of access and social space is where I wanna come in. Who is included and who is excluded in these VR spaces I'm curating? During my research and discussion with colleagues, professors and VR artists give two examples that keep coming up as how VR approaches disability. The first is a pretty broad example that focuses on creating content for people who are not physically able to go to certain locations to virtually visit them. It's a basic idea of access and the possibility of VR. This is my second example and more specific. Um, this is Third Wheel. It's a VR piece directed by Andre Roy and produced by the NFB that premiered at the DocX program at Hot Docs in 2017. The synopsis of the seven minute VR film is quote, in this compassionate and enlightening VR experience, a high school gym class plays basketball entirely in wheelchairs to allow their classmates with muscular dystrophy to participate, end quote. VR participants are asked to sit in a wheelchair that swivels 360 degrees to experience what it's like to play wheelchair basketball. If you have more examples, I'd love to hear them in the QA. However, these two examples focus on VR content but they also point to what disability scholars call the medical model, focusing on the individual and for able-bodied people to experience what it is like to be disabled. Similar to when students were asked to cover their eyes with a blindfold in order to experience blindness. This focuses on the differences be between disabled and abled bodies and focuses on what is wrong with disability. For Alison Kafer, quote, people with impairments are disabled by their environments, or to put it differently, impairments aren't disabling, social and architectural barriers are, end quote. And I wanna to turn to this social model of disability to question how we're curating VR. Maya Mingus asks, quote, as organizers, we need to think of access with an understanding of disability justice, moving away from an equity-based model of sameness and we are just like you, to a model of disability that embraces difference, confronts privilege and challenges what is considered normal on every front, end quote. So what is considered normal for VR? For many of us, we're used to seeing the classic trade show or film festival style of VR curation of sitting in a chair, preferably one that rotates 360 degrees with a headset on in isolation. Film festivals have set the bar and a precedent on how to program VR. But let's break that down a little bit more. For one, you must be able to put a headset on and be strong enough to have that headset on your face. Many headsets do not allow for glasses, so you must have very good vision. For some VR experiences, they want you moving around to better experience this virtual world. You should be able-bodied or be able to move a few steps in front, side, and behind you. Sometimes the experience causes you to move from side to side, up and down without getting sick, so no vertigo, epilepsy, or motion sickness. Game scholar Rebecca Redden says, quote, VR is designed and implemented in a way that assumes the user is able-bodied, which means frustration, pain, and disappointment if you're not. If VR doesn't change, it will continue to be non-inclusive, inaccessible, and isolate people from a cultural experience, end quote. These questions of accessibility with VR games is nothing new. Redden also says, quote, if we're not careful and attentive, we run the risk of leaving behind people in the virtual revolution. A fun virtual reality experience should not require an unimpaired sense of motion and balance. It should not require a height level. VR should not have an implication that the user is able-bodied. This isn't a revolutionary concept, end quote. Disabled gamers and game advocates have been asking for changes for decades, so the information exists. One recent example is in December 2016, the Disability Visibility Project and Lucasfilm launched the VR Accessibility Survey. 
The goal of this survey was to better understand the accessibility issues in VR and to collect recommendations by participants based on their experiences. 79 survey respondents discussed the adjustments they needed to enjoy VR. For example, multiple users in the study talked about the difficulties of using a power chair and having to push it around at the same time. They also outlined how difficult it is to use without full arm mobility and how the headsets aren't always compatible with hearing aids. Visually impaired users expressed how small fonts negatively impacted their experiences, especially when they try to move closer to the object in question and it vanishes from view. This is not an exhaustive list of issues that was mentioned in the survey. It should be noted that the demographics of this survey were American, white, and male. It does not point to issues of accessibility with VR that we continue to have and how important it is to have differently abled bodies in the room from the beginning. Many disability game scholars discuss creating their own controllers and accessories to be able to physically play these VR games as a way to combat the hardware accessibility issues. But moving away from games, some VR filmmakers, such as Olivia McGilgrest, who will be talking on Friday, um, who's been very vocal about the way some new technologies sometimes exclude other cultures and their experiences. For instance, McGilchrist highlights that in the VR headsets don't always account for voluminous hair. She says, quote, I've only dug into that recently, but because of my heritage, I'm constantly questioning why there's this sense of white male supremacy in tech, end quote. And for her VR experience, she created these wooden structures for people to relax and feel comfortable and knowing that no one was going to come up, for, come up behind them so they could be better immersed in their VR experience. She says, quote, I really feel that both the software and hardware will benefit from being developed outside of the Western context. I hope that will generate a very different form of engagement and results both commercially and artistically, end quote. That was a very brief survey of some of the accessibility issues discussed by game scholars and VR makers. But what is my role as a curator? Leah Lakshmi Pipsenza Samarsina, and I apologize if I um, have pronounced that incorrectly, is a queer disabled femme writer and organizer, performance artist and educator who wrote care work, dreaming disability justice, says, quote, Access is a guilt-ridden afterthought when it's thought of at all, and it's usually only thought of when disabled people ask about accessibility. This request is usually responded to with guilt, with defensiveness, with surprise, with bad or non-existent or last-minute scrambles for access, or simply able tears. Because as Quo Lee Drixel says, one way ableism works is that disabled people are not even present within the imaginations of a supposedly radical future, end quote. So for one of my first VR programs, I've been working with the Fabulous Festival of Fringe Film for three years. And with this first program, I was so caught up in the technology. I had a lot of questions. What headsets do I use? Where do I get them? How much will they cost? Where do I get the films? I had chosen, I'm traveling to multiple locations over two different weekends. What do I need to make this work and start creating a mental list? Extension cords, power bars, headphones, Lysol wipes, and this was pre-COVID, not to mention the labor involved in setting this all up. I volunteered my partner and we spent six hours the night before setting up the headsets, making sure that everything was downloaded in case I didn't have access to Wi-Fi, testing them over and over and over again until I felt comfortable using them. The first weekend I took my VR program to Saugeen First Nation to the opening feast where I had six headsets and chairs set up and we were busy. Every headset was in use until they all died. But what I noticed was that pe the people sitting in the chairs were all under 15 years old. And these kids saw every film twice. They would have sat in those chairs for hours, but none of the elders came over. And it took a lot of convincing to even get some of the parents to try on the headsets. The second weekend at the Durham Public Library, I had two people with wheelchairs in the room and there was no room for people to come in and out. And the lineup was so long that they had difficulty leaving. I also had a user who could not communicate with me and could not wear the headphones I had provided. Thankfully, the Oculus Go headsets had speakers in them, so his father could hold the headset while his son immersed himself within these worlds. But as Piepsinza Samarsina writes, these were afterthoughts and quick fixes that did not address the issue of disability access. Ironically, the purpose of my program was about access, to showcase some of the best Indigenous VR in Canada, to bring VR to two communities who had not seen any before, VR is still an inaccessible medium. The headsets are still expensive and not all the films are available online. Film festivals are still the only place for the general public to experience what is in my opinion, some of the best VR being made. And I wanna bring accessible VR to these communities. I was so overwhelmed with the technology that I left access and disability to the festival. I trusted them to find a space that was accessible. 
Mia Mingus writes, quote, we must, however, move beyond access by itself. We cannot allow the liberation of disabled people to be boiled down to logistics. We must understand and practice an accessibility that moves us closer to justice, not just inclusion or diversity, end quote. But how do we move beyond logistics when curating VR? How do we grapple with the restrictions of community-based film festivals who are on a very limited budget? When I've brought up this issue of access with some VR scholars in my own department, the response has been that the new Oculus Quest will completely change the game with accessibility in VR as users will no longer be tied to a computer. But the Quest is still $600. For my first program, I begged and borrowed equipment from Janine Marcheseau and Archive Counter Archive and Dames Making Games, an organization who's also thinking about these questions of access and are actively trying to make these technologies available to whoever wants to use and learn from them. So now that I'm comfortable with the technology, how do I approach this? I again want to turn back to Pizienza Summer Cena. Quote, when I think about access, I think about love. I mean that we reach for each other and make the most access possible. It is a radical act of love. When access is centralized at the beginning dream of every action or event, that is radical love. I mean that access is far more to me than a checklist of accessibility needs. Though checklists are needed and necessary, I mean that without deep love and care for each other, for our crypt body minds, an event can have all the fragrance-free soap and interpreters in 36 inch wide doorways in the world, and it can still be empty. I've been asked to do disability and access training by well-meaning organizations that want the checklist, the 10 things they can do to make things accessible. I know that if they do those things with, without changing their internal worlds, that see disabled people as sad and stupid, or refuse to see those of us already in their lives, they can have all the ASL and ramps in the world, and we won't come where we're not loved, needed, and understood as leaders, not just people they must begrudgingly provide services for, end quote. So for my next VR program, I'm co-curating with Jess Satch. They are an artist, writer, and performer whose work addresses the negotiations of bodies moving in public, private space, and the work of their care. The original idea was that we wanted our programs to be about experimentation. I got together with Jess and Debbie Ebanks, the previous festival director of the fabulous festival of Fringe Film, to discuss our next program and to hear their thoughts on access and disability with VR. But also from looking at this point of access as an act of love and moving away from thinking about accessibility as logistics and thinking about access before we even start curating our program. Some central questions that came out of the discussion are, what are we asking of people when we give them a headset? For the elders at Sogging First Nation, Debbie said it was an issue of trust and safety. The elders were uncomfortable with blacking out their senses and the complete lack of control. Jess told me they were initially very hesitant towards VR because of the safety issue. When they attended my exhibition, they picked a chair in the far corner where everyone was in front of them, so they knew no one was going to come up from behind them, and so they knew where everyone was. They also did not want to be expect a spectacle trying on the headset for the first time. Just pointed out that there's also an emotional, conversational and relationship side to VR that we need to address. Can we set up a space that is safe? Can we bring the conversation into the room? For Jess, can we make a space that has the comforts and security of home? Additionally, additionally, Jess asked, what are the emotional care steps needed to be taken before the headsets go on? We must come to terms that not all audiences are comfortable with not being aware of their surroundings the complexities of trauma and embodiment, and that there are a lot of people out there who are very uncomfortable with the embodiment aspect of VR. Docent, translator, VR assistant, they go by many terms, but VR requires assistance from someone. For my program, I was a tech assistant along with Debbie's son, Eric. Our job was to talk about the VR and find out if the person had seen anything. If not, perhaps they try something milder. These conversations were important to make our audience feel comfortable, to walk them through the steps of how this technology works, and to prepare them for what they were going to see. Just pointed out, everyone requires help with VR. So we are wondering, can we use the docent as a way to make no one feel single out or tokenized when trying on VR? For me, I'm wondering how can we create a best practices guide for VR that isn't just about logistics or the 10 steps? How do we get other VR curators and film festivals to look at this in a different way and be more open to experimenting with spaces? Can we work together with VR curators and filmmakers in an attempt to create these spaces that is about the virtual experience, but also about the physical experience of putting on the VR headset? These are just some of the ideas we are talking about that I wanted to share with you today and how we're trying a new approach to thinking about curating our next VR program. 
And we view it in these terms rather than from a disability individualistic approach. And here's where my idealism is coming in. I hope everyone benefits. A wider audience, more inclusion and new ways of looking and experiencing VR. This is a very long quote and that's how I was gonna end, but John, I think I'm out of time. So I'll just leave it at that and quickly, if you are interested, I highly recommend looking at these sources. They're very good. Thank you.